Hola, comadres. Welcome to another episode of Comadreando Podcast. I'm your host, Marcy, and today we have an amazing guest. She is a published author. She is a life coach. She has her own food IG channel. Um, she's just like an all-around amazing mom, and I'm going to let her introduce herself. Her name is Belki. Go ahead, Belki. Introduce yourself, please. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Belki, and I am an autism mom. And I say that that is the first and foremost thing that I am because that is everything that rules my life. Um, and yes, I am a published author as of recently, <laughs> which I'm still in shock because, you know, I'm, I'm here with like Temple Grandin, who has, um, you know, one of the chapters in the book. So I'm co-authoring with her. So to me, that was like, ah, <laughs> when they told me. And, uh, you know, I... Um, that's I have amazing. several, in, yeah, I have several incarnations in my life. So, you know, I started as a uh, advertising and marketing communications, um, you know, degree working in advertising. Then I quit to follow my passion as an actress in New York City. I did that. Then my son was born. Then I quit acting because I wanted to be with my son who has autism, right? And then I became a uh, special, like a coach, a life coach. I got certified with that. And then while I was doing that, I also started cooking a lot more and really expanding the cooking and then becoming a food blogger, YouTube content creator. I work with a lot of brands, um, uh, you know, when it comes to recipe development and things like that. So as you can hear by everything I'm saying, I am a busy girl with lots and lots on her plate, but I wouldn't have it any other way. So, yeah. Oh my God, come on, this. she's like literally <laughs> me. No, seriously, like everybody calls me todologa. They're like, ella sabe hacer de todo. Like she knows how to do everything. You literally yeah, are a todologa. To. Yeah, but I think it's in our blood, you know, as Latinas, mm -hmm. as, you know, we, 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 I don't know about you, but I'm first generation American. Like, you Same. know, we, we kind of bring it. We have to like represent our people and we have to make, are people proud and that's really why i'm here right so that's it so you you just never give up you just keep going you keep fighting you keep finding something else to do you find opportunity in things that are challenging which is really where i yeah. come from is something happens to me that becomes a challenge in my life and that maybe changes my life forever then find the opportunity in that yeah, so, amazing. Yeah. And guys, yeah. she's Dominican, de lo mío. <laughs> Dominicana, <laughs> soy santiagueña. <laughs> Del Cibao, lado, right? Del Cibao. <laughs> I'm from La Vega also. <laughs> oh, so you're like a neighbor. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So um, getting into the topic today, um, comadres, today we're going to be covering something. I asked a question a few weeks back to the comadres regarding taboos and communities of color regarding labels and diagnoses and the reason why I asked the question was that um as a special education teacher and also as a mom of a child with autism I've noticed that a lot of parents are very reticent against having their child quote-unquote labeled and um more so getting them an IEP or getting them the help that they need right um I know a lot of it has to do with ignorance, unfortunately. But I really wanted to kind of like delve into that and like analyze what it is. Cause at one point I thought it was like, was there something historically that happened to people with communities of color regarding special education that people are so like against it? So, um, mm -hmm. I did a lot of digging. I read a lot of articles <laughs> and, um, I'm ready to talk about it <laughs> in a more <laughs> informed way. Um, yeah, so before we get into the nitty gritty, um, so you told us your child's diagnosis, Connor, right? Your mm -hmm. child's diagnosis is autism. Um, what, just like kind of, I know you talk about it in the book a little bit, but just like, when was it that you noticed that something was quote unquote different in him? Um, and we can start with that. So, um, he was diagnosed at, uh, 20, uh, 21 months, right? But I knew something was different at 11 months or right around his first birthday. But one thing to bring up is he was born premature. He also was one of multiple babies and he was the only survivor of that pregnancy. And then he also had a brother who was 16 months older than him. Therefore, I can already spot the differences in how they were 
developing. And um, one of the things that was more um, impactful for us as a family was that he had started to kind of wave, you know, buy high kind of thing. And then he kind of stopped. And then his eye contact was a little bit different than I remember it being when he was a baby baby. And I was like, ah, something's not right. Como que está pasando acá. So I went to my, you know, pediatrician and said, you know, I think something's off. And they're like, oh, well, he was premature, blah, blah, blah. He's also a boy. They develop late. And you know, the whole thing about boys and that they're slower than girls. And I'm like, I don't yeah. know. So it took me a while, but eventually around, um, I think it was 20 months or so. I was like, listen, something's not right. I want you guys to get him tested. At this point, they already said he was a little bit delayed in development. And we started some like, you know, therapies with like playing and putting little like, you know, buttons and holes and things like that and putting puzzle pieces together. Um, and then they gave us the, um, all, like all the appointments for the developmental pediatrician for the speech and this or that. And then sure enough, everything came back as he has autism. So here we go right away. I already, I was actually one of the very few people in life that you'll ever meet that was like, yeah, <laughs> you know, he has autism because I was like, I yeah. want to help my child. I just want to help my child. So then right away I got on it. I didn't have enough time to like process everything, even though I kind of already in my mind knew. So then right away we started all the therapies, everything. And fast forward today, he's 13, still nonverbal. Um, but you know, because of his very difficult beginnings of his life, like it kind of makes sense why he is in the, in the position that he is, but mm -hmm. he's also someone who is very smart, despite the fact that he can't talk. He this is the thing I've been trying to. Yeah. Yes. He communicates through his iPad. We use for local to go. It's an app um, that has, uh, he's been using since he was about four, I believe. Um, and yeah. then he asks us, you know, I want milk and it's pictures, everything you know, has a voice that you get to choose what you want your sound to, your, your child your to sound Your voice to sound like, like yeah. And, yeah. So, you know, now that, that, you know, here I'm living in Arizona now, so i moved from New York a while back and, you know, the, how do I say, we, we just out of school now for the summer and, you know, the whole summer, my, my focus, my goal is going to be to teach him how to ask at restaurants for what he needs. Very yes. picky eater, <laughs> very picky eater. So it'll be like, where I'll have it on the iPad, like the restaurants that he prefers, like what is it that he likes to order and mm -hmm. we're going to get there we're going to just it's all about just getting them into a rhythm of getting to know where am i what are the things that i do i do here what do i mm -hmm. in this case it's restaurants what do i order when i'm here so that kind of thing so so you kind of know it's 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 a whole process with our kids and we learn what to do with every environment that we find ourselves in with our kids I love it. And um, the fact that you know, obviously, that he's a picky eater, but you're still trying to expose him to different environments and different cuisines as well is amazing. Because, like, a lot of parents, for fear of, like, their child having a meltdown, won't even, like, attempt to, you know, no. give we, him the food. Actually, which I don't blame them because there's a fear. You know, you don't want your child to not well. act. Yeah, not <laughs> act the, the way that everybody wants them to act. Like, I... I don't give a crap yep. anymore. And we, um, we did, uh, he's going to do what he does for many years too. We did Aiden did too at the beginning for many years. Yeah. And I just I, literally ended feeding therapy about three months ago. So we have been like trying really hard to get him to, cause there was a while where they were like, Oh, he's going to have to have a feeding tube. And I'm like, Oh my God, no way in hell. I'm going to mm -hmm. make sure that this kid eats. And it's better and better every day. And it's about having patience, being kind, and presenting the food. More than one time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And more, and like, maybe like 30,000 times. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was times. looking, I don't know if you follow the autism dietitian. Um, she oh, actually, no. oh my God, you have to follow her account. She posted um, a visual saying, like, as opposed to presenting your child with a full meal with weird foods, like non non-comfort foods, you, pr you give them what they like and give one or two pieces of the new thing so that they associate something they like with that new food and they'll have a taste yes. for it more often. I, I mean, Aiden, you know, one of my tricks, 
one of mm -hmm. my tricks. There's like, uh, he doesn't like pasta or rice, right? So what I do is I'll like, let's say I'll make like a pesto pasta that has chicken in it, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll get a big piece of chicken. And then sometimes I'll like quickly when he's not really looking, I'll grab a piece of the pasta, then a piece of the chicken and the pasta is like laying right under you sandwich it, right? Yes. And then I go <laughs> ahead and I'll put it there and then he grabs it and puts it in his mouth and he doesn't know he's eating the pasta. <laughs> my my yes. thing is with That's Aiden is win. I know it's like the small victories. My thing with Aiden is like he loves rice and chicken and oh any kind God, of actually he calls all the meat chicken. So with Mr. <laughs> Aiden, he is anti vegetable. If he sees anything green, he's like, "Oh, take it out of my plate." So well, I'm kind of like that, you know. And I'm in my forties. I, I don't like that. So look at Joago. What I do is that I um I make a moto like you know the rice with the beans inside of it. Because there's some comadres that don't eat Latin, Latin food. So um, I'll make rice with um, uh, some kind of beans inside of it. And I'll chop up the pepper. <laughs> it's really, really small. And the onion's really, really small. So then I, when it cooks down, it has the essence of the pepper in there. The flavor. But he, the flavor. But he doesn't see it. So he's not yes. going to be like, I don't want it. Yep. But yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like the way I we discover like how to... It's yeah. the way we discover how to like give him things. It's crazy. He had a, oh, he had waffles the other day for the first time. I was like, ooh. He's like, more waffles, cheese. Awesome. I want waffles with eggs. I was like, okay. How old is he? How old is he? He's thirteen. He's the same age as as your oh son. My but God, I think Aiden. Okay. Aiden might be one year older because Aiden turns fourteen in November. When does Connor turn fourteen? Next year in March. Yeah, so they're like one year yeah. apart almost. They're a year apart almost. Yeah. So the early intervention went well, and, and I love the fact that you guys are so involved, and it seems like your family, like your husband's very supportive, and, and I read in the in the passage, in your chapter of the book, that your son was also very supportive, that you guys were teaching him how to um, use cues and like speak to Connor in a way that he will mm -hmm. understand. Like, how can you just give us like kind of like a, a, a the way that you introduce that to your son? Well, to start, my other son, like I said, he's just over a year older than him. So he he is the contrary of Connor in the sense that he's super, super mature. So when, um, I mean, he's almost like our father because he will scold us if we don't do something right that, that we maybe told him, you need to do this, you need to do that. Wait. And then if he doesn't see us do it, then he goes wait, wait a minute, you, you're, you're not doing this, you're not doing that, like, what is wrong with you, and he, oh my gosh, so it's really funny, and um, so it's, it's very nice to see someone who's so involved, who's just a little older than him, yeah. Um, so yeah, so the way that we taught him is, it, clearly he, what's interesting about him too, is that, that he remembers him, he remembers like him at the NICU because he was in the NICU for three months when he was born. Connor was. So he remembers his trips to the NICU to see his brother. And then he remembers him coming home and all the health issues that he went through when he got home. Um, so I think that his involvement with him has been since he came home, you know, since he was a little baby. And then Connor had colic when he came home. It was really bad. Um, and then, and Evan is, which is his name. He's 14. He'll actually be 15 in November. Like, like your son, November birthday. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So he, he's always just been very involved. So it's kind of a natural progression in our family. So, mm -hmm. you know, like if, if let's say I buy lunch or something, or I make dinner and I feed them both at the same time, uh, like I don't have to worry to watch Connor to make sure he eats, he's eating his dinner because I'll say, Hey, Evan, just make sure your brother's eating his dinner. And Evan's Aww. like right there making sure his brother's eating his dinner. If he needs anything, he's right there to give it to him. So, so it's not just like my husband and I, but we have like our third little other parent, that, 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 <laughs> the, yeah, other parent who like really has some sort of invested interest. And he also oh my God, I love that. that he will always have him like he's like he's never going to a home or anything like that because oh my you can't God. take care of him he's coming with me oh, and Bucky, you're gonna marry. make me cry no and, yeah and he says i'll never marry anyone who doesn't want him to live with us oh my so god i'm hoping he follows through but i always make sure that he understands like that's 
that's you know you don't have to do that um but yeah. if you do it that's wonderful but you don't have to do it oh my god that reminds yeah. me oh i don't know if you have you watched love on the spectrum yet Oh yes, I did. I, I did you watch the, the one in the USA? And the one in the US, yes. So I that reminds it. you of the sister, of the sister that has the brother in the house. Well, I forgot his name. Mm-hmm. The Indian. Family. I forgot his name, but I know who you're saying. But th- that was like so. She like lives funny. with her brother. Know. Like she gave her parents basically a break. You know, like she took over and is making sure that he's socialized and he's doing the right thing. Well, not the quote unquote right thing, but like. You know that he's living an adult life, that he's living so that a he doesn't build inf- life for his mm-hmm. condition. I think. I mean, I watched it and I thought, you know, if Connor, I don't know because obviously he also has some brain issues, but I'm like, if he's able to have that kind of life, because obviously he can't speak, but maybe he'll, he'll communicate at some point because he's only 13 and miracles yeah. do happen, right? I'm like, I would be so happy if he yeah. was able to be like, I found this person that I love to hang out with and I love to spend time with. They don't have to get married. They don't have to be physically intimate yeah, to enjoy course. each other's company, you know? So that's what I'm hoping for him in the future. So, que sea lo que Dios quiera. You know? Eso va a ser. It's going to be that way. Um, so, mm-hmm. wait, tell me a little bit more about Connor. So, he's a picky eater. He is <laughs> yes. very good at communicating with his communication device. And what else? What else about him? Like, what what makes him sparkle? Like, what are the things that he's like, cookies, like that he cookies. loves? Cookies? <laughs> cookies. Which kinds, though? He's like, we, we, we used to call him the cookie monster when he was little because he loved cookies so much. But he goes through phases. Like, he'll love, like, um, Belki, you froze chocolate on me. chip cookies. Or he'll love vanilla wafers. Or right now, he's in the in the uh, fudge cookie phase. Ooh. So, he goes through all that. But then he also loves uh, popcorn. And he also loves, like, these... Um, uh, I can't remember what they're called, but th- these like really healthy kind of cookies. Uh, I can't remember. I remember the name of the cookies healthy right now. Healthy cookies? But, yeah, these healthy, <laughs> like they have blueberries in them and, and they're like Velveeta. Velveeta is what Oh, the Velveeta, Velveeta, the breakfast the breakfast crackers. Breakfast ones that have like, you know, like, so he gets into these like phases where he really loves one thing and then he's like really into it and then he drops it and then he moves on to the next thing he really loves. That's and then totally on brand. Eat, yeah. And then he'll still <laughs> eat like, you know, the popcorn or he'll eat like, I don't know, some crackers of another kind, but nothing like his favorite thing. He knows how to give it everything a break, but you know, he's, he is into water. He loves water, but doesn't drink soft drinks or juices. It's just water okay. or milk in the morning and milk at night. But other than that, it's just water. He drinks water all day long. <laughs> so, so he has his quirks, but he's, he's super sweet. He's very loving. He has his moments, but he has meltdowns and all that, you know, because imagine if you can't effectively communicate how no. it's frustrating hello um yeah but for the most part he is like super loving and it might have to do with the fact that we since he came home from the NICU all we did was give him kisses and hugs and you know we were Aww. so grateful that he survived you know amen you yeah know, his yeah and he had a twin sister who didn't so we were like this is getting all the love he can probably get in the world so you know so he just he's very loving and if you meet him he'll probably be hugging you and laying his head on you oh so he's that's super so sweet. sweet yeah super sweet is is there so my son is into dubbing videos and he oh, really God. likes right now the cart the the cartoons that he likes is um Adios mio. Como se llama? Um, it's on Disney. It's like these little, oh, Bluey. It's like a, it's like a dog family, oh. whatever. Mm. Before no. that, it was like My Peppa son Pig. Is reggaeton. Es reggaeton. Uh. That's what he, Pero bueno. know, which is really weird. <laughs> so he loves, it's, it's so strange. So he can't talk. So he can't tell me why, but he loves like, you know, like, Bad Bunny. Video, music videos is what he likes to look at. So, for example, right now he's into like Nati Natasha and Becky G. Sin Pijama. Uh-huh. So at school, uh-huh. they're like, do you know that Connor's watching like these two girls? <laughs> these women in lingerie, scantily clad. And, and I'm like, yeah, I don't think he's watching them for what they're wearing. He just really loves the song. <laughs> oh my god, it's so bad, it's so bad. But he loves, like, he just really loves anything, like you know, criminal with Nati Natasha, or like okay. right now he was like um, J Lo with uh, Nelly. 
uh, are you ready? Da, da, oh, pero es viejo. Okay, okay. Da, da, da. Yeah, so he finds these songs and he just loves to watch music on YouTube. <laughs> and then he is a huge... So this is where his white side comes in because I'm Dominican and his father's like white, like Ito. Yeah, so yeah. His, he watches 21 Pilots. Um, so okay. I mean, you know, you know, I know the band. Yeah, yeah. Is. yeah. So he loves pretty much every song of theirs. So he also, I went through my gringa video. phase in college. Oh, okay. So he's going through <laughs> the Dominican or Latina phase and gringo phase at the same time. So you'll see him watching all sorts of music videos. It's, it's really hilarious because I really wish that I can say like, how did you find this video? I don't know because I tried to watch him and I don't know how he goes from like one extreme to the other when he doesn't have certain things on a playlist. Listen, they know how to find the things. Like my students who don't know how to read or write in pre-K, they're like, hey, Siri, play uh, such and such cartoon on my iPad. Um, it's they really know, funny because I'm just like, how? How do you know? But it's, it's, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love so it. So it's like when, when I tell people, they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, he goes from this thing to that thing. And it's like two completely different worlds of music. But it's amazing. Somehow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wait, does he like Bad Bunny though? Yes. yes. Yay. Yes. He's a Bad Bunny. Yes. <laughs> he likes, he likes pretty much any reggaeton. Like right now I'm like trying to teach him, not teach him, but I downloaded a few more songs. Um, that I'm playing in the car. So he also likes to sit in the front seat and then like I'll Aww. play music and then he'll like, if he doesn't like the song, he goes, which means like change, change that song. I don't want Yeah. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh wait. So it's for the people that are not watching the YouTube video, she was pointing to the, to the left, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, kind of, Cause usually right. I'm sitting to the left and then he's on the right. So he's pointing like. This at way, the radio to tell to, me to, 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 yeah, to change, change the channel to change it and i usually have the iphone you know the itunes hooked up to my car mm -hmm. um yeah and anything that pitbull sings too he's like he, he loves of course pitbull is like with the counting down and all that mm -hmm. stuff he's like um there was a meme you remember that he's like crazy he's like a headbanger in the car <laughs> I love it. So I have a lot of fun. I have a lot of fun. I have to say. No, I mean, that, like, I was just um the episode that aired yesterday. We were talking about how having a child on the spectrum and then meeting other moms of kids on the spectrum. It's like you're you're like exchanging X Men card, X Men trading cards. Remember, yes. you're like. So what do they like to do? Oh, his special ability is this. You know, and it's so cool because as a teacher, I get to see all of it, and it just makes me so happy. Especially once mm -hmm. once you like tap into whatever it is that they like you can literally teach yes. them anything as long as you involve whatever it is that they like and they just learn it a hundred percent so getting into the topic okay. regarding labels and diagnoses so i looked everywhere um regarding was there like some kind of historical context regarding um special education and communities of color and I literally found nothing. There was no, um, mm -hmm. there was nothing that they were doing specifically to black and brown people in mm -hmm. special education classrooms. However, I did find at one point, um, the kids were being overdiagnosed. Kids that were not, that did not have special needs were being placed in special education classrooms. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't necessarily because they had special needs. It was the teachers who are not people of color were working with them and um anything they did was being misconstrued as um like oppositionally defiant disorder um learning disability the teachers weren't really trying and um mm -hmm. yeah so now like the lens now the way that we look at it is before we send a child to be evaluated we the teacher needs to show that they were actively trying to teach the student that they use different yes. approaches that there was different tiers of intervention that were provided for the child and that there was still no progress mm -hmm. which is good and bad because a, a lot of the time a lot of kids slip through the cracks one mm -hmm. some parents are not aware too and um you know it's really doing a disservice for the child because like if i'm seeing something in the classroom and i'm telling you like hey Ding ding ding! I'm getting the I'm getting my little what is it called um my my radar is going off 
Yeah. Come on, listen to me. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's not, yes. I'm not trying to escape from having 32 kids in my classroom. I don't care. One more, one less, 35. I don't care. The yes. thing is, like, if as a special education teacher, I'm telling you, hey, we need to pay attention to this behavior. I'm noticing this. The child is reversing letters and they're still in fourth grade. Mm-hmm. There's a problem. Yes. And I think there's something that needs to be addressed. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I think a lot of what happens, too, is that, you know, the school district, of course, because I've seen this over and over and over and over again in the years where I've been a special needs mom, talking to a special needs mom, and people who don't have special needs that someone's told them they might have special needs, right, is, yes, the teacher can see signs, right, but a lot of the times, or not a lot of times, Sometimes it could be, yes, the child has an issue. Then the school needs to let them know, okay, this is what's happening. But the school, at least what I've experienced, I can't speak for where you're working right now, but they'll tell you, we think that maybe you want to get your child evaluated. In some states, you can't legally tell a parent that. Yeah, no, you can't. Right? So so therefore, you might say your parent's doing this, doing this. You're kind of giving them an idea, like go get your child tested for something. Hopefully, the parent gets it, and then they get tested outside of the school. Um, mm-hmm. Just because the teacher says that, or just because the, the school has these metrics of evaluating um, what may be happening to a child, or maybe they, what they think is happening, you need that that diagnosis outside of the school by us, the psychologist or psychiatrist professional mm-hmm. um, or development professional to tell you, okay, this is what we, we found that is going on with your child. This is the diagnosis. Then you come back to the teacher. Then the teacher says, okay, this is what I'm seeing. In my experience, once we got a diagnosis, then the school did their own testing and then they had their own level of diagnoses and, and what they found, right? So you have your, your professional outside of the school district, and then you have your teachers and, and the, you know, the speech therapist or the PT or the OT mm-hmm. in the school, and then they give you their assessments on the child. Then you kind of take, in my experience, the, at this point, the doctor has nothing to do or the evaluators outside the school have nothing to do with what the school comes up with on an IEP or a 504 yeah. or whatever it is. Therefore, now it's the school's responsibility to now put together a plan that works for your child. As a parent, you can accept it, not accept it, uh, make amendments to it whenever you want to make amendments to it, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I also think, and from my experience and having seen it, there's a lot of time that children from our lower you know, um, what I don't even know what the word to call it, but our lower, um, ah, I'm trying to find the right word, um, from our communities that maybe they don't have the financial economically. ability, yes, economically, or maybe they're in a home where they're seeing certain behaviors happening in their home, a disenfranchised communities, might, communities that are, you yes. know, in danger, that their child, exactly. the children are already in danger of falling behind because they don't have the resources that all the other like other families have but yes. it's m- m- there's a larger propensity for the kids especially if they are a yeah. special needs to be undiagnosed exactly but also some kids may not have any kind of diagnosis other than they're living through trauma mm-hmm. and then they're coming to school and exhibiting certain behaviors because of something that's happening at home that mm. they're dealing with and then that might be called oh maybe they have you know oppositional defiant disorder i actually know two kids um Mm -hmm. that have you know odd and Mm -hmm. um you know they don't have it because of what they're seeing at home they have it but if you're also talking a child that has trauma from ptsd things that they're experiencing at home it may Mm -hmm. come across to an educator as maybe oppositional defined disorder, but what they're doing is mimicking behaviors that they're seeing at home. So it's also a thing where you have to kind of locate, okay, where is this coming from? This is something that's coming from their home experience, what they're seeing every day, they're bringing it home and they don't know how else to act because Mm -hmm. this is how they see their parents acting or other family members acting around them. And then is this a child that actually has this situation happening and they do have this disorder Mm -hmm. And then now how do I, how do we identify that? And that's where you bring the parents in. And that's what you say in whatever way you can say without getting sued. Right. Yeah. (laughs) You can't get sued if you bring in these 
questions, you know, to mm-hmm. parents, which makes it really hard on the school district or a teacher like you when you think maybe this is what's happening and then you're like, well, I'm afraid to say something or, you know, offend these parents. And, yeah. you know, so you guys have it really, really hard when it comes to identifying a lot of the time, especially something like ODD, right? Mm-hmm. I, I would say because you don't know if this is just model behavior or there is actually something going on with the child. So I want to touch on three things. <laughs> so, um, Regarding the suggesting for a child to be evaluated, there's a way that I do it that I'm not going to be sued by a parent. And um, I just want to kind of put it out there because there's a lot of comadres that are actually teachers as well. So regarding the behaviors that you see in the classroom, first, what I do is get to know the child and the family, right? That way I can figure out if it's trauma-informed behavior, if it's PTSD from other things that they've been through, I ask other teachers, like the previous teachers, like, what's the family history? What was going on? Did you notice anything while you were with the child? Um, because I'm noticing such and such behavior, I'm a little concerned, right? I bring it up to the previous teacher. When I find that out, talk to the mom, right? Um, then if I, like, start taking notes on behavior, like, I know... A lot of you have thirty something kids in front of you. You don't have time to take full, fully detailed notes. But if it's like one behavior or two that you're noticing, you can take a tally, like keep a tally of how many times it's occurring in the classroom, or um, how many times you happen to notice it. Or if it's like something that is, mm-hmm. like I had a kid who was actually on the spectrum, but his IEP said speech delay, and I didn't know that. And then he would have these monster meltdowns because I wasn't giving him enough time to finish the task. Okay. So instead of keeping tally marks, because it was not as, it wasn't happening as frequently as let's say like hitting a kid or whatever. I was, I would notate the duration started at blah, blah, blah time, finished at this time because of, and then I would note the triggers, right? What was it that caused the child to behave that way? You also have to be cognizant about things that you can avoid, <laughs> especially when you have yes. a child that is has autism, hasn't really fully been evaluated, and the parent refuses to get them evaluated. You know, things to notate, like things like that, and like avoiding those triggers. And especially like for that kid, I was able to solve that a little bit by noticing like, okay, he's running out of time to finish the task. I can tell him he's going to have time <laughs> come back from the special or lunch and that's that's the whole thing that that and give them a timer you know know? yeah and that's the one of the things that that really upsets me about the fact that parents won't uh, accept maybe a diagnosis or accept um that their child might have some extra you know help need is that they don't understand the, the, the chaos and the stress that they're causing their children. Yep. So by having an IEP, by having a 504, I mean, your child doesn't have to even, you know, be, uh, you know, in very much need on the spectrum. But if you give them an extra time, that ex- and then they know that they have that extra time, they have no idea how much of a relief they're giving their child. Yes. And that's what really drives me crazy when people are like, oh, no, no, no. Uh, you, me. I know, I know people. <laughs> and and what really upsets me is that unfortunately a lot of them are Latinos like us. Yeah. Who don't want to accept that their child has some special need, that they need more time for this, more time for that. Just because your child can speak and tell you off and send you to hell doesn't mean mm-hmm. that your child is a hundred percent perfect and doesn't need extra accommodations. A lot of the times they do need extra accommodations and just imagine how much better they're going to feel if they are given those. Um, And then the other thing I wanted, the last thing I wanted to touch on is that it's really hard. Like the school has limited resources, especially public schools, right? They have limited resources. The evaluation they give, I want to say it's superficial. Why do I say it's superficial? They're very limited in the testing that they can do. The school psychologist is not, um, you know, a developmental pediatrician, is not a neuropsychologist. There is a certain amount of tests that they can do. The other tests are not covered in the school. Yeah. So what I would suggest if a parent has 
real concern about their child and they feel like so it's more than just speech. If you notice behaviors accompanying the speech delay, have your child evaluated. The, like the, the worst that they can tell you is no, they, they, it's just speech, right? You don't lose anything. But mm -hmm. for those parents that are in um, financial situations where they cannot pay for it themselves, guys, you can have it paid for by the Department of Education. Yes. What you need to do is write a specific letter with data. So if your child, let's say, started at reading level D at the beginning of the school year and has only moved one reading level by December and has not you know, progressed and you notice that the reading is not improving. You don't see them progressing in the education. You see that their test scores are not great. You notice that on the report card, also the behavior, have the teacher write this down. Take all of this and write it down in a letter and ask specifically for a neuropsychological evaluation provided by an outside agency. Okay. Mm -hmm. Once you do that, they will pay for it. And then it's your job to find a, a, a neuropsychologist that will do the evaluation for you and that you feel comfortable with. And another thing I'm going to say is that when you have that evaluation, it's going to take, depending on how much your child can tolerate, it might take two to three days. So you might have to take some time off of work, but investing the time is going to um, reward your child in the long run. Yes. And some insurance plans will cover them as well. Yes. Some won't. A lot of the time when you sign up for these evaluations, they can take a few months depending on the state that you're in. Sometimes you list, have right? to wait months because the, the, the waiting lists are long. For some reason, there's a lot more children that are being, um, you know, submitted for these tests. Um, and then there are also, you know, speech, OT, PT, depending on the age of the child that you might want to get extra evaluations on and that you might be able to be eligible to get help right through the school district or the government. It depends. Um, in our case, one of the main, not even the main reasons we moved out of the East coast and we moved to Arizona because we wanted a different lifestyle. We wanted warm weather. We wanted a pool year round and mm -hmm. we just wanted to give our son who, you know, our, our young son, who's at 13 now, <laughs> not so the young. best quality um, of life. Yeah, the best quality of life. And I felt like, you know, this is just what we want to do. But then coming here, we found out that we have an amazing, amazing government program for our kids, uh, for him, especially, obviously, um, where we get, you know, respite, we get um, therapies, all of them covered by the government, because we can prove that he has a disability. And I get like 700 and something hours a year just for respite, which means somebody that can babysit, someone that can mm -hmm. maybe drive him to school, someone that can maybe take him to therapy. We have OT, PT, speech, um, OT, PT, speech, feeding, all those were covered by the government once a week. Is he getting community um, habilitation as well? Uh, yes. Well, that's part of, of HAB. So then we also get 15 hours a week HAB. So that's rehab, rehabilitation. Um, so that could be in the house, outside of the house. It could be to help them learn how to brush their teeth. It could be anything that has to do. But just imagine all these services. I had yeah. no idea that was even possible when we moved here. And then we got here and I was like, oh, really? We can do all mm -hmm. this? So we have all these hours that, that we get every week. We, we found someone that we trust that is part of our family now. Um, so maybe sometimes you may be not in the right place depending on your, your child's functioning level. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something to look into. Like what are the better places to live where yeah. I can get all of these services and they're not coming out of my pocket? So, so no, th those are things to look into and, and Arizona has been the place for us and we just love it. Even though it's amazing three months out of the year where we're melting, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> we're happy. And that's what matters is that we're happy. Listen, I'll take that over the, the freaking <laughs> snowfall, the, the cold in the I, winter. I, you know, I'm telling you, it's uh, even in the winter here is like in the seventies. So, oh my God. um, it's Beautiful. just perfect. It's just so nice. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so it's, it's just about finding the, the, the best place for your child and their functioning level. Yeah. That's what we found. So in the research also, um, I found that 
a lot of Latino families were against having their child diagnosed. Um, and some of the reasons were um, embarrassment. Mm -hmm. They felt like they were going to be judged by other people, by other family members, especially the men. You know, this machismo um, idea. Culture um, that we have. <laughs> culture, the idea, um, you know, having a child that is, quote unquote, not normal um they look at you like you're the weakest link um you know that was that was one thing another thing is but it, that it, it goes it mm -hmm. goes back to the whole thing about you know we latinos love to care about what people have to say about us what mm -hmm. the neighbor has to say about us like Ay, el que dirán. That we el que dirán. what are they gonna say yeah or, or, yeah or like our you know our our neighbor our cousin our aunt our uncle our sister, our brother, our mother, our father, like who cares what they have to say? You know, I think people need to put more attention into their child. What's going to make their child a better functioning person in society versus what your uncle, your cousin, your neighbor is going to think about your child. And guess what? Some of these children are going to be way more successful than the other child next door who is supposed to be typical. Because a lot of our children have very vested interests mm -hmm. in certain things that make them very successful because they're focused. They know what they want. They know what they like. They're not scattered, you know, and, and that's what I tell a lot of parents. Another thing that I love about our kids is that they don't give two craps about anything that anybody has to say. And they don't sugarcoat anything. They don't care. <laughs> they really don't care. They're like, oh, well. Yeah, I'm going to tell you how it is, and that's what it's going to be. Um, another thing I wanted to say is the label. Like, they, a lot of parents say, oh, I don't want my kid having a label. Nobody's going to give them a T-shirt that says, I'm autistic. And nobody's going to give them a T-shirt saying, I have ODD. You have Nobody, to put it on them. Even in the school, <laughs> even in the school, a child has an IEP. We don't discuss that. Unless is the person is directly working with that child and it's on a need to know basis because due diligence is when you get a child on your caseload or a person that's in your classroom that has an IEP, you as a teacher have access to it electronically. You get a copy of it in paper. You read up on it. You do not hear, share that information with anybody. You don't have to tell anybody label, your child. Yeah. You don't have to tell anybody your child anything. Your child. That label is put on that document and that helps your child. Just like we discussed earlier, they'll get more time for tests. They'll get, you know, uh, maybe they get to go to other classes that other kids don't get to, to mm -hmm. go to. Um, so they will get more help. That actually helps your child get to the next level more easily. And it's not like no one's looking at them saying, oh, this or this or that. And again, I say that not just because of my child, but because of mm -hmm. other kids that I know on the spectrum, because I have so many friends with mm -hmm. kids on the spectrum at all levels. Mm -hmm. And it only helps them. IEP 504, it's not just for kids with autism. And believe it or not, there's kids that are on the spectrum that don't even know they're on the spectrum that I know because the parents yeah. will not even tell them because they're high functioning and the parent doesn't want them to know they have all these extra supports at school and they have no idea why they just yeah. have them, but you're getting, you're setting up your child for success in the future. And that's the way that I look at it. So if you care about what Fulanita has to say, then you have a problem. It's, it's, it, you're not being a good parent. If you care yeah. what somebody else has to say, just, just focus on your child and what it is that they need, not on what Fulanita or Fulanito has to say or is going to think about it. I agree. Also, I want to say that time is of the essence. Don't waste time. Don't wait. <laughs> like, just like what you did, I did the same thing. I was like, hmm, uh, this doesn't, no, this doesn't sound right. No, we're getting him evaluated. That's it. The yeah. most I can tell you is be like, oh, um, yeah, no, we didn't find they anything. Don't have it. And then you're like, okay, fine, I'm good. Okay, like, exactly. If, you know, then you feel good. You you did your job as a parent, which is to look out for your child. And you don't have to take whatever the person that evaluated them as a as a, like I, ha I have a uh, another the episode that's airing next week. The mom got speech delay on the IP, but she knows her child is autistic, so she is advocating for actually having that put on his IEP. Because as a special education teacher, as a district, mm -hmm. like working in the district, you know there's a certain bag of tricks that you need to work with that child. You know what I'm saying? Like, especially mm -hmm. if you have the label. But 
Speech and language is so vague. You don't know what that means. That that could be like, oh, no, hey, you, the kid doesn't speak as tied. much. You can, ha- you can have issues because there are certain uh, uh, disorders like, of the tongue yeah. and things like that that doesn't allow a child to pronounce words correctly, but their thoughts, their processes are pretty typical. So mm-hmm. therefore, a speech delay or speech language and pet, like it, it, it's so big. You, you can't. Mm-hmm you know yeah the more specific the better and the more services that you can receive and the the more likely your child is to succeed with those um you know services in place that are going to help them in the long run um 100 mm-hmm. so emotionally a lot of um i feel like a lot of the parents that a lot of them are in denial you know it, and a lot of it is cuz even okay so you would you would think that parents that are older, like older than us, we're in our thirties, right? You would think that people's in the fifties and sixties oh, no, are the girl, ones. I'm, I'm going to be 48. Okay. I'm says you don't even lick your age. First of all, <laughs> I'm over there. okay. <laughs> I'm up there. So I'm going to tell you right now, you, she does not lick her age. You guys, if you guys are not watching the it's YouTube the Dominicana video, blood, the Dominicana blood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that you would think people from like the older generations before us are the ones with the mm-hmm. issues. And then, and the thing is that, those people have taught their children to have this taboo mentality of like, mm-hmm. oh no, me, oh no, my child does not have that. No, they don't. And you're looking at the kid and you're like, uh, y- y- mm. like you don't want to like, cause that's another thing, yeah. right? If a person is not in the mental state to receive the news that their child is has special needs or that you're confirming a fear that they already have, a lot of the time they lash out because I've had that happen yes. to me. They'll yes. discredit what you're saying. They'll say yes. that I don't know what I'm talking about or, mm-hmm. oh, you just want every kid to be, have a special need or whatever. And I'm That's just like, you do. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, so okay, happy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I uh, like, I don't know what to tell you, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a lot. It's an emotional thing. I remember one yeah. time when Aiden was first, um, and I actually haven't spoken about it on the show. So when he was first having reactions um, that he was like the, the, the onset of autism was coming, I remember him like moving around a lot. He didn't want to wear shoes. Um, and somebody was like, oh, And they said it like that, como de caída. And I wasn't ready. And I felt so horrible. I felt so horrible. Like afterwards that he wasn't speak, like he eventually spoke and then stopped after that. Then I was like, okay, but like in the moment, especially alante de toda la gente, como que te tiran así como de repente. They call, cosas, like, they call you out all of a sudden. And it's like throwing a bucket of cold water on somebody that's very warm. Okay. Yes. So there's a way to bring things up to people. Please think about the other person, especially if you see something in their children. Do not, don't be a jerk. Yes. Like, but these are still human beings, you know, and people yeah. have their hangups. And if you speak to them from a place of love, they're most like more likely going to receive the message in a way that they're going to absorb it. But I also think it, it's a matter of education, right? right. Unfortunately, I feel, I feel like, like, you know, being that I've lived in Dominican as well, I was raised in New York. I was born in New York and raised between the two countries, right? I have lived many years in Dominican too. It's about education. A lot of the people that I grew up around were not people of education. And when I say yeah. of education, like even my mom and my dad didn't even get to high school, you know? Mm. So mm-hmm. what happens is they don't understand um, how to maybe sometimes speak about something that's a condition that somebody may have. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of the time, at least in my, in my opinion, the way that I have gathered like any kind of comment that comes from a family member that I know is old style thinking, mm-hmm. I, I don't take it to heart because I already know I'm educated. I went to school. I got a degree. I've been outside of DR, for example, and studied and been around other cultures they don't have the culture and the upbringing that we have and been surrounded with as much as we have and in Mm -hmm. my family uh, there's only been like a couple other people who went to college in dr other than that nobody went to school nobody finished high school so what happens is they have a mentality that's a little bit more brute 
como, mm. como lo que decimos nosotros como medio bruto. unrefined like, like yeah unrefined the, not the deliver thing yeah yeah the delivery is not kind sometimes and I don't think that they mean to be mean it's not from it's a just, place of hate or 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 no, being an asshole not at all. It's just like, ah, pero qué pasó con fulanito? ¿Qué es lo que está pasando ahí? ¿Qué te pasa con tu muchacho? ¿Qué es lo que está pasando? And it's not like they mean to be mean. It's yeah. just like they are not thinking it straight and they're just blah. It's like diarrhea of the mouth kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then I think that's what we have to learn to accept as the newer generation American, right? Because we're, we're either born here or mostly raised here. And yeah. we're being subjected to all these other cultures and, and all this more education, more available resources to us. So then we also have to understand that, that we have this, but then we also have to take advantage of those resources and yeah. not listen to the other voices of our older, you know, parents or people that are making us feel like maybe, you know, this is an embarrassment. No, I think you have to do what you have to do to help your child. And at the end of the day, that's what matters the most. And eventually, nobody's going to care because your child's going to be yeah. loved, no matter what. Another, uh, one thing, I, um, I want to do a sidebar. So one thing I brought up to my mom because um, the, pedi- the developmental pediatrician was asking, like, hey, have you ever considered having genetic testing to see if it comes from your side of the family or the dad's side of the I family? I did it. You did it? Mm-hmm. Um, so I told her my mom was considering it and, um, she was just like, do no I'm like, I don't know if it's, for, if it's from our side of the family. Like, yeah, but she's like, nobody's what? labeled autistic in our family. I'm like, there's people with, guess what? There's, you know, on either side of us. So there might not be any on either side of you. Pero que eso es lo que yo digo, like, but okay, like, what, what is the resistance to actually having, mm-hmm. let's say I do come out to be ADHD, maybe I come out to be on the spectrum. Que eso, eso no es nada, there's, no, there's nothing wrong it with it. It doesn't change who you are, Marcy is Marcy, and Marcy is the same Marcy that Marcy was before you found out that Marcy had anything, let's say. It actually it gives people a large sigh of relief like one of my one of the people that opened the season for season two now she didn't get diagnosed until like later on in life and and they just explained so much to her one of the moms that is a comadre that is a listener she has two boys that are on the spectrum she has four children two of them ended up being evaluated and, and have autism and she got evaluated herself and she's waiting for the results she actually ended up having ADHD and and mm-hmm. instead of being sad and be like oh my god what was me she was like wow this explains so much you know she gives herself exactly. grace more because of because you know when you don't know much about yourself you're so harsh because you're con- comparing yourself to or neurotypical you people or you don't know enough of the diagnosis itself because mm-hmm. if you think about it what is the big deal about ADHD I don't get it I don't get it. Like you mm-hmm. can have ADD, you know, there's, there's medication that can help you with that. If you mm-hmm. needed it, it's not like all of a sudden, because you have ADHD, you can't function. You can't get married. You ha- can't have kids. There's coping mechanisms. The exactly. And the same thing with autism. In my case, I have a child who's severely affected with autism. And that's one story. Obviously he's really affected, but there's other people who have autism. Like we talked about in autism and love, or even, higher functioning than the people showcased on the show that are going to have a marriage. They're going to drive. They're going to have a house. They're going to be able to pay for their bills. They're not going to need someone to take care of them. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's about how you view your diagnosis basically, or your child's diagnosis. Yeah. So let's talk about the book. Cause we haven't actually told the oh, yeah. the title. And the name <laughs> yes. of the book, hold on. I have it right here. Let me just pull it out. Oh, yeah, it's a bit for me. Okay. You it's can tidy. tell the title to the comadres. <laughs> for the love of autism. For the love of autism. For el amor al autismo. Basically. Yes. It's and it's it's, it's so and many it's beautiful short stories. It's a, col- a collaboration. Temple Grandin is in there, which is like... Yes. Psh, like, when they told me, I almost died. I was like, what? And listen. Like, yeah. And I did not know until the book was finished. I didn't know anything about autism until I watched a documentary on HBO about Temple Grandin. And I was like, oh, Dios mio. And this is when Aiden was first getting evaluated that I watched there that. There you go. 
There you go. And, and I was like, amazing. wow, look at this woman. Look at this woman. You know, she was evaluated in the 60s or the 50s? Or something like that. She's she's like uh, low 70s in age right now. So, and, and like the one documentary, not documentary, the one movie with Claire Danes. Um, yeah, that's Claire the one. Danes plays her. Um, so in that movie, like what I loved about it was that it showed you how, she, because she was the consultant for that movie of mm-hmm. herself. Like she would show you like if she was looking through a little crack of something, like what she was thinking when she was doing that, which is yeah. interesting because my son will focus on little things on a wall or something. And I'm like, I wonder what he's looking at. And then she, in that movie was saying, well, when I was looking through this and I would, and I was like, oh, like, you know, so Claire Danes is a tremendous why. actress. Claire yeah. Danes is a tremendous actress. She pulled that And off. she, yeah, she did such a mm-hmm. service to that character. And then another thing, this is like completely off topic. Um, I was watching um, Fantastic Beasts, the, oh, the yeah. um, Secrets of Dumbledore. You know, I'm watching the movie and I'm looking at, at new, new Scamander, right? The, the main character. And I'm like, this guy could be on the spectrum. So I Googled it and it's a thing. Like, he is definitely, is. you know, a person on the spectrum. Like, not only that, but then they said um, Eddie Redmayne, which is the main char- the, the character, that pl- yes. the actor that plays the character. He, I believe, is on the spectrum himself. Ooh, but the way that he... Up. Okay. I mean, so I the love way, him, but I didn't know that part. Okay. So, I mean, I don't know if it's a rumor or if it's true, but, but like know. the way, rumors, the way that, the way that, the way that he plays new is like, so our kids, like, yeah. hyper-focused on animals, prefers to be with animals rather than with people. This is literally my son, Aiden. Yeah. He um knows so many facts, like, it doesn't really look people in the eye when he's speaking to them. Um, you know, socially awkward, like really like, I'm just like, wow, this is like all the traits. good. You know what I'm saying? Like all the traits, but, um, going back to the book, sorry. So yes, yeah, yes. I'm like so proud of you. This no, is, this is really, and your yeah, chapter is amazing. Book. Yeah. Your chapter is amazing. You. Do you want to like share a little bit about it? And then I'm, I'm going to make sure I drop the link in the show notes so that the commanders can okay. pick it up. Well, in, in reality, like my chapter is basically my story of the birth of my son. And it was a pregnancy of multiple babies and two of them were born. One of them passed away. Her name was Natalie. She was a beautiful little girl and um, obviously it's been 13 years. So I could talk about it. I couldn't talk about it till like, I don't know, six years ago. That's when I could talk about it. Um, but yeah, so it just talks very briefly. Like, I think that I really should write a whole book about the experience and everything I've, I've I've had issues conceiving. So both my kids were um, Mm -hmm. kids that I had to do, you know, fertility treatments to have them. Um, And that was the first pregnancy was easy. Only one baby just to term. Everything was great. This pregnancy was not that case, um, which was shocking because, you know, how do you go from one to the other end? Um, And then just about how, you know, the struggle was from, you know, being looked at as you're a crazy mom because you want your child to be looked at because you're seeing differences and you know then of course then being looked at like you're crazy because you're excited that you got a diagnosis but the reasoning behind it is because now I can get help for my child Mm -hmm. and then just you know little bits of how it's been you know since um and I think the hardest part um in reality, it'll never get easy in, in my situation because my son will always probably rely on help from from our family. But it's basically, you know, just the story of where everything started and where it's at today. And then my letter to my child at the end, um, you know, that hopefully one day, you know, he's able to understand and read. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, and, and of course, the book has other stories of people who are on the spectrum people who are caretakers it's really a great book like it's a wonderful collaboration of 20 authors so i I love that everyone should own a a copy of this book definitely (laughs) sign me up um (laughs) no but i love how you give like tips to parents at the end of the chapter like to teach them how to support their children and how to be to help mothers because that's a yes. that's part of what you do as a life coach as well you help moms navigate mm-hmm. this whole that diagnosis and kind of like yes. you know how to be 
pour into yourself so that you can be there for mm -hmm. your child, which and is one, one of the thing. biggest messages that I have in the show. Yeah. And one thing is that I even said it before well, and I kind of just used you as an example, but like one of the, 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 the big takeaway that I have learned through this whole experience of being an autism parent. And I, I believe my husband as well is that, you know, let's say I got this diagnosis today about my son, Connor, right? My Connor is the same Connor he was the day before this diagnosis. Mm -hmm. There's nothing different about him. The day you get the diagnosis, you just find out, okay, they have autism. Now let's find out how to help them, how to make them have, obviously, the most fulfilling life that they can possibly have to be the most productive that they can possibly have, you know, of a life. But they're no different than the child they were all this time up until today. So mm -hmm. don't treat them any differently. Don't feel badly for them or for yourself. Just get on there, do the work. And don't worry about anybody but yourself and your child. And that's it. Because and if you definitely take everything on, you're going to go nuts. Yes. And definitely, I love the fact that you said having a support system, which is like friends, family, people that you can rely on, that you can talk to. Having friends that don't have kids on the spectrum, you know, to kind of commiserate about being a parent. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, making time for your spouse. Like, there's yes. a lot of people that I know that, it just turns into everything about the child, which I get. Mm -hmm. But another thing that I, another message that I have in my show is like, you're still, you're more than a mother. You're not just a mom. Yes. You and are a woman. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. What's interesting about this whole thing with, when it comes to your partner and the person that you're with is that my husband and I have been together 26 years and we've been married for 22. So we were long before we had children together. So mm -hmm. therefore we made that, we had that kind of relationship, but then what happens when you give everything to your child, but then you don't, you know, water that relationship. What happens is that then you have nothing when these children are gone. And that was the way that I used to think about before I even knew I would ever have a child with a disability was, mm -hmm. you know, I want to make sure that he and I have something that's solid, that's good. So, and, and while the kids are growing the same thing so that when the kids leave the nest, we're not like looking at each other like strangers because we have not, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? Nurtured our relationship. So yes. that is important. We go on dates. We, we know if we can't go on a night date, then there at school, we go on a lunch date. I love Whatever that. It, it needs to happen to make sure that we, you know, and we try not to talk about the kids. We talk about stupid stuff, whatever it is, you know, it could be anything, but we just try to have a good time together. And yeah. that's, I think really, really important that you're still that same person. He's still the same person that you met whenever ago. Yeah. Wow. I love this conversation. Thank <laughs> I you. I want to have you back. <laughs> wait, and well, then wait, I have back. pick another topic and I'll come back. Wait, I have two questions from a compadre, okay. not a comadre. Hold oh, on. compadre. Okay. Vamos yeah, a we have some, okay. we have some Let's compadres speak. that listen to the show. Okay, wait. Dun, dun, dun. Hold on, I'm looking at okay. As a parent of a, an autistic child, how do you learn to accept the love of someone new into your child's life? When do we let our guards down? Well, I've never been in that situation, but the one thing that I can say is that if you start dating someone and you have this conversation surrounding the fact that you have a child with a disability, whatever disability it is, and you notice that that person has kind of trepidation around it, then that's already a warning sign. And then when they meet, you will meet. Uh, to me, I feel that that's one of the things about women Perdón, compadre, but women, <laughs> we have this intuition and we can kind of tell, you know, when something's not right or something just doesn't, como que algo no está bien ahí. Yeah, like, so mm. that's what I say. Follow that intuition in your heart and don't think with another head. Think with this one. And then you will know that that person is maybe not the right person to bring around your kid and bring that person around when you know they're going to be someone that's going to be in your child's life. Because that's what I say all the time. Want, yeah, the last thing you want is for this person to be around and suddenly they are experiencing a loss of someone who was around and they're suddenly not around. And to me, yeah. that's probably not a very good thing. And that's more devastating loss. for the kid. 
Yes. And especially because they don't understand is, why. Exactly. They, they may not be understanding. Like then they might even take that as a personal rejection. Maybe they mm-hmm. don't want to be with my dad because of me. So mm-hmm. just really think about it before you bring, and that's the same thing even for a mom, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the compadre also asked, how do you trust that this person really loves your child and has their best interests at heart? And I feel like you answered that already. Yeah. And you're going to see it too. Cause that child's going to be asking for that person. If that person left an imprint in them, they're going to yeah. be like, you know, where's Fulanita? They're going to ask for that person. And when Fulanita comes around, there's going to be a smile. There's going to be a hug. There's going to be something because you know your child best. That's going to give you all the indication that you need, that this is someone that you want around your child. Yeah, and and I can say from little man over here, like, if he doesn't want to, if something's off about somebody, he's not going to ask for them, or he won't mm-hmm. even demonstrate any interest of being around that person. Yeah. It's like, I feel like he still does kind of parallel play with socialization in a way. Yeah. So he'll be in the area where there's like a social situation happening. He won't actively participate, but he'll still sit with us. So he'll yes. be at a party. He'll be having mm-hmm. dinner, but he's not necessarily quote unquote participating. But if I see him initiating and wanting to be around, then I know that that person is a good person to have around my child. Yes. We, we really know them best. A hundred percent. Yeah. So Let's not be blinded by love. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Lust. We can say it. We can say it. Don't be blinded by yeah. lust guys. Think with the la cabeza arriba, <laughs> the head, the head on top of your on top of your shoulders. <laughs> All right, and with that, I am going to end the show how I always end it. Follow me at Comadreando Pod on Instagram, and guys, I have a Twitter now, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. <laughs> TikTok, I love TikTok. Okay, um, and you can follow Belki on Instagram at. You could drop your handle. Belky's Twist at Belky's Twist, and that's because it's for my blog, my food blog mostly. So you can see me there. You'll see me there. <laughs> I was showing my students here. I was like, I was like on IG, like look, like researching, and I was like, oh my god, look at this food. And my student was like, oh, Miss Campos, why are you doing this to me? To me, my mouth is watering. <laughs> I'm like, I'm watering. <laughs> Just imagine how lucky I am to eat that kind of food every day. Yeah, it's so good. Um, so if you have any questions at all for Belki or for anything, if you want a future episode, slide up into my DMs. Send me a comadregram via email at comadreando at escthenetwork.com. And thank you for spending time with your comadres. Bye. Thank you for having me. Bye. <laughs>